So blobs. We mentioned earlier, they're really kind of a, a folder system, or if you want to think of them in those terms, that holds anything we want to put into it. With the names of the files, we can mimic some folder level behavior. We can actually even set access policies on the containers. So maybe I've got things that are publicly visible and other ones that are private. And while I can list the blobs that are in the containers, I can't actually do any searches or queries on them. Now, there are two different types of blobs, and we won't get into these too deeply today. I just want to call them out. Block blobs are really targeted towards streaming workloads, where you read it and just read it all the way through to the end. They're limited at 200 gigabytes, which is still pretty big. But when we flip over and look at their cousin, the page blob, he can go up to one terabyte in size. But he's really trying to focus on read and random access. So let's say you wanted to build your own unique indexing system. You might build it on page blobs to allow you to be able to read just chunks of that out of there as necessary. Uh, Azure storage tables, or entity tables, as they really think is a better term for them, allows to store simple key value pairs. So if we look at the example here, we've got a table that has a first name, a last name, a birth date for the first three columns. Now, if you look at the birth date, you might notice something a little strange here. I actually have three different types of dates that are in this. That's because Azure tables themselves really don't enforce any type standards. Anything you want to put in them and give a column name or a property name will adhere to that. That's why we can also do something like this fourth column that's out here, favorite sport, which really only applies to our Nancy row. She's the only one that has that set. It's not set for anybody else. It's completely optional. Now, this can come in handy, just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about it, but you'll use it at your discretion. You can still create a very structured table that's very rigid and adheres to your schema, and we'll see how to do that here in a few minutes. Now, each row or entity that's in a table can have up to 255 properties with a maximum size of one megabyte. As we said, no fixed schema. Everything's stored in kind of a key value or name value pair. The schema is not stored in the table. And we do have some basic support for all the general rudimentary data types we're used to. Strings, GUIDs, binaries, what have you. Now, there are two of these keys or two of these values that are absolutely necessary. The first is a partition key. Now, the way Windows Azure achieves the high scalability that it promises with Azure table storage is by dividing the tables up into individual pieces, or partitions. It will then move those partitions around behind the scenes for us. But the partition gives a way for us to keep everything that belongs together together. So let's say the previous example where I had people, maybe the partitioning key is the state they live in, or the zip code they live in, or the color of their eyes. It would depend on how I want to access the data because I want to keep everything that I'm going to be querying together as close as possible so I'm not having to span my queries across multiple instances within the data center as it moves my partitions around to make sure I'm maintaining performance. Now, along with the partition key, we also have the row key, and together they form a unique index. So that would be the primary index in our relational database terms. Today, that is also the only index that's on the table. So if I can perform a query on the table using the partition key and row key, it'll be very efficient. If I query by things that are not part of that index, we can pretty much bet that it's going to scan the entire table and come back with what it finds. There's also a timestamp property. Now, that timestamp is really just used by the internal system to help maintain what's going on and when things are updated. We can look at it, we can use it, but we really can't do too much else with it. Now, I mentioned briefly that partitions will float and move around in the data center as it needs to for Windows Azure to keep everything up and running. It does that by monitoring the different usage patterns. It will automatically load balance these partitions to make sure we're getting the, the traffic that has been committed to as part of our SLA and keep things moving. So the simplest way to think of this is if I have two folders or two partitions that I'm storing all my stuff in, and those are sitting in a single filing cabinet 
and all of a sudden, 10 other people are trying to access that filing cabinet at the same time I am, it could get a little congested as we're all pulling drawers in and out and trying to access things. But if Windows Azure has the capability to look at me and say, you know, you're trying to access the first of those two folders a lot, I'm going to go ahead and move that folder to another filing cabinet that doesn't have a line in front of it. Now I can access my data without having to wait for the other eight people that are in line. It's a little scary knowing that our stuff's moving around until you realize that you don't actually have to manage it. Windows Azure doesn't tell me I have to go to the second filing cabinet. I just walk up to the Azure Fabric agents and go, I need this folder. It knows where it's at. It goes and retrieves the data and hands it back to me. So queues come into, the, come into play when we decide we really want to start decoupling things. Yes, we live in a world of SOA where everything is service-oriented and it's needed right now. We've been doing asynchronous and synchronous service calls continually. We tend to forget some of the older technologies that are out there that allow us to really scale things out, load balance work across multiple people, and not tie up precious resources like TCP IP ports. Azure queues are one mechanism to give us, they have been given to us to accomplish this. So on the left of my picture down below, we have web roles that are pushing messages into a queue, and then we may have some worker processes on the back end that will act on that and pull the messages out, process them, and maybe push messages back into a response queue. The real important part here is if the workers go down, the users that are hitting my front end web services are not impacted because I'm just having those push messages into the queue. When the workers come back up, they can now start reading those messages from the queue and operating upon them. It reduces the amount of real-time connections I have and allows us to balance that traffic out without giving a bad experience to my users. Now these have some pretty good throughput targets at 500 transactions per second per queue. So we can end up using multiple queues if we need to, even reading them in batches, and even batching up multiple work items per message, whatever is necessary to take that and really start cranking through the data. So again, we actually want to see some code. So I've talked through the basics of storage. We're going to look at doing a basic blob upload. We're going to look at a simple table sample. And then we may actually go out and show you what hosted storage looks like. So let's see if I can flip back over to here. So let's start by going back over to wherever my folder was. All right. So if we go back over to my sample app, I'm actually going to go up a level and we're going to grab some sample code that I have here and let's drop it down into my web application. Start by opening up the blob sample and walking through that one. So here we go. Very simple little PHP file here. We start off at the top with a form multi-part form. It's got a hidden field allowing me to upload a file. I've got an input file control that's going to allow me to select a file and a submit button. All pretty basic. Inside of the PHP brackets, we're going to check and make sure we have a file, and we're actually going to echo a message once we've completed the upload. So let's start adding some code to this. I have those over here. So let's start with these first three values here. What's going on here is this first require statement brings in the Microsoft Azure autoloader. But wait a minute, where is it? That's the first thing we got to do. You have to go back over and grab that autoloader. So if we go to where the PHP Azure SDK was installed, in this case my C drive, Program Files, Windows Azure SDK for PHP, Library, there's a Microsoft folder. And if you remember the picture from earlier, inside that folder is all the files I need. So I'm just going to copy that, go back to my PHP solution, 
and I'm going to paste that in. So it's now part of my project. What that'll do is when I reference, let's go back over to my blob sample real quick. The fun bit again, here are too many files. Next time I'm just going to have to share my desktop. I'm sorry about this, folks. So if we flip back over here, this require once will bring in that Microsoft autoloader. Now the autoloader will scan through and find any other requires we need based on the objects we ask for within our code. So it really simplifies us not having to track down which pieces we need. I've also then got two containers here. Now, if this was live, I'd ask you guys for some names here. But we'll just stick to something that's easy to remember so we're not having to wake Brianna up again. I know she's enjoying her afternoon now. And we'll go um, two names here. <laughs> okay, you weren't as asleep as I thought. All right, so what I've done is I've given a container name. Now, the container, if you remember from our blog, is the highest level. If we want to think of that as the filing cabinet we're going to put stuff in. Okay, so that's the name for it. And I'm going to give a name down below. I'm putting in the name of the folder I want to use. In this case, we're just using the day of the week, Wednesday. And then to the end of that, I will append the name of whatever file I'm uploading. These really just set some variables I'll use later. Moving on, we need a client to actually access Azure Blob Storage with. So let's get that created. Now this first one instantiates Microsoft Windows Azure Storage Blob. This is an object that's contained within the SDK that allows us to interact with Azure Blob Storage. It abstracts away that REST API for me, just allows me to just use simple methods to create and manipulate it. That's the first line. The second line, we're going to call a method on there called create container if not exists. Now we're going to do that because the first time I run this, this container won't actually exist, so I need to build it. In reality, we probably don't want to do this every single time because it means it's an extra operation or an extra REST call that's going to Azure Storage. So if you're actually building a production level application, you're not going to want to do this, but for our needs, it works just fine. 